Thank you, Greg, for that wonderful introduction, and Amanda and Julie and everyone at Living Future um, for this amazing gathering. Uh, it's, it's really nice, actually, to, to be speaking to you near, near the end, after you have already heard from so many exciting speakers <clears throat> um, who have done so much to name the challenges ahead. Um, and I'm able also to take it as a given that you understand the urgency uh, of the need to build a very, very different kind of economy. If you didn't understand that, you wouldn't be engaged in the work that you're doing to try to forge a different relationship between humans and the natural world and between each other in community relationships of reciprocity, regeneration, um, and renewal. You wouldn't be trying to restore the natural world to health or to build regenerative communities. And you're doing all that already, and I thank you for that. And it means that I can also skip the usual apocalyptic version, uh, portion of, um, of my presentations where, where I you know, prove that climate change is happening, that it is very, very scary and dangerous, and we're basically out of time. Um, we will just move forward to the most pressing question, um, which is how do we win deep political transformation so that the kinds of living models that you are all forging in your work, in your communities, can spread at the velocity that is required to keep us all safe. You know, I don't like this phrase we sometimes hear, you know, how do we take it to scale? Because I don't think it necessarily has to be big. <laughs> But I do think we can do a lot of, we have to do a lot of small and medium size very, very quickly, right? And we don't do that without policy, without real political change. And so when I look at the equation on the podium in front of me, um, the genius, well, I would say the genius is there, it's in this room, right? So it's, it, the challenge has, for a very long time, has not been about whether or not it is possible technically to do this. Um, it's often presented as that kind of challenge, right? Well, 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 the technology isn't there and so on, right? Well, it is there, right? And we know this, we know from fantastic researchers like Mark Jacobson at Stanford University that with existing technology, we can get to 100% renewables for the entire economy well before mid-century which is what we need to do if we're going to keep temperatures below 1.5 to 2 degrees, which is what we said we were going to do in Paris, right? So the problem is not lack of genius. Um, I don't think it is lack of courage, although there are issues around courage, but I, I agree that it is more about unleashing the latent courage, creating opportunities to express that. But I think there is another piece of this equation, which is about power which is about how do we build political power? Um, because we are up against forces that are actively trying to stop us, right? And often when we talk about sustainability and regenerative economies, we forget about the power equation. How do we build movements that can win, okay? So I wanna focus on that a little bit, and I was thinking about it recently because I was in Santa Barbara at a conference that was celebrating uh, women in the environment, and it was celebrating the particular role that Santa Barbara played in launching the modern um, environmental movement. So they were talking about how the very first Earth Day was held, um, was ground zero of Santa Barbara uh, in 1970. And that, uh, that, that Earth Day, which you, know, you all know this history, you know, millions of people participated in these teach-ins and, and demonstrations across the country, it was this awakening um, and that led to a series of breakthroughs in legislation that really formed the backbone for environmental law in this country, right? This, the, the meaningful strengthening of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and it happened very, 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 very quickly in rapid sort of staccato succession in the early 1970s, which is an important reminder, I think, sometimes when we feel overwhelmed by how much change needs to happen and how quickly, is that when it does start happening, it often happens in this way, like a, 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 a dam breaking, and then suddenly things start changing all at once, right? You know, it reminds me of the, the, the Nelson Mandela quote, you know, it's it always seems impossible uh, until it's done, right? 
And, and so I was thinking about that. And, you know, and frankly, I think the idea that Santa Barbara launched the environmental movement is slightly problematic, and I told them so. You know, I think it, we should probably backdate it to the earliest indigenous resistance to colonial land grabbing. Um, but just you know, for the sake of argument, um, let's say Santa Barbara did it, um, and, um, or did, did something very important along the way. And if we look at the ingredients <clears throat> for what produced that moment, right? It wasn't they had a big protest and won a bunch of laws, right? There was, a, there was something else that happened a little bit earlier. And that has to do with the role of crisis and the role of shock, right? Because one year before Earth Day was the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, right? Um, do, I have, do we have slides? Are my slides there? Oh, good. Oh, I can't see them. There it is. There we are, yeah. Oily surfboard slide. <laughs> I see it now. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, for, for, for the younger people in this audience who don't know this history, this was an incredibly shocking event, right? With, uh, oil drilling off the coast of California was already controversial. And then there was what, at the time, was the largest oil spill in American history. Thousands of birds were killed. There were these harrowing images of seals and sea lions and otters absolutely coated in oil. These beautiful beaches covered in oil, cliffs covered in oil. And um, you know, the record for the world's largest oil spill has since been surpassed, um, first by Ex the Exxon Valdez, then um, by the Deepwater Horizon. But it was intensely shocking, and there was this response, right? Earth Day the next year, this staccato legislation. <clears throat> and that's the way the story is often told, right? Crisis, reaction, legislation, right? The sort of frog in boiling water theory, right? Um, we, we were shocked, we jumped, right? Um, but that leaves out what I think is a very important ingredient in what actually produces deep political change in a culture. And that was what was happening before the shock, right? So think about the timing of this. It's 1969. It is the end of this decade of, of, of revolutionary thought on so many different fronts, right? Whether it's the counterculture, whether it's the civil rights movements, um, whether around the world it is the rise of anti-colonial movements, rising up, over overthrowing colonial powers, overthrowing dictatorship. Revolution is in the air. Everything is on the table. People are dreaming in public. Um, most notably, Martin Luther King about a vision of, of radical equality uh, and inclusion. Uh, but also the counterculture is putting everything on the table, questioning everything about industrial society, from the nuclear family to the suburbs, to the equation of happiness with con the, uh, consumer bubbles, right? Uh, um, and, and, and this eventually led to uh, the limits of growth and questioning the role of growth in, at the center of a capitalist economy. So, the reason, and, and, and within the environmental context, earlier in the decade, 1962, you had the pub publication of Silent Spring, um, which was a deep challenge to a previous era of environmental writing and thinking, because Rachel Carson was not talking about the need to sort of save um, particular green museums, green spaces in which to recreate, but really she was challenging this fundamental relationship of humans as conquerors of nature, right? Um, as dominators of nature. The whole idea, she called them the control men who imagined um, uh, in her mind with such profound ignorance that they could control the natural world through the, with the use of these military tools that had been honed um, in the Second World War, right? And apply them to the natural world to try to get rid of insects and not realizing the rebound effects that that, that would unleash. Um, so, so it was, it was really about a paradigm shift, right? Really about challenging what is the role of humans in the natural world. And, 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 you know, you could see it as a demotion, you could see it as a promotion, right? That we have to live, understand that we live in community with one another and with all living beings and, and, and in relationships of reciprocity with the systems uh, upon all life uh, 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 depends. 
So, so all of this is happening in the 60s, and then the, the spill pierces it, right? And the spill is held up as the ultimate evidence, as exhibit A of the madness of this system that would sacrifice all of this life, all of this beauty, just for short-term profits, right? So that is why the, the shock was able to be metabolized in this way. You know, and I remember when I was covering the Deepwater Horizon disaster, talking to oceanographers who were so frustrated that that spill wasn't producing anything. They were saying, you know, the Santa Barbara oil spill got us the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. What is this going to get us? You know, better, you know, a little bit of better technology on oil rigs. That seems to be the only legacy. So why is that? And I think a, a big part of it was that in the 60s, there was this presence of, uh, uh, of dreaming in public, of really pushing the envelope. And it is worth remembering that the president who passed so many of these laws, or under whom so many of these laws were passed, was um, not that good a guy. It was Richard Nixon, um, a name who's, that's been in the news lately as our pundits search for any kind of precedent for what we're seeing in the White House. Um, and the truth is that, that Nixon, though um, he shared a fair bit in common with Trump, his duplicity, paranoia, obstruction, the truth is he passed more and better environmental legislation than Obama. Um, and that is not because he was a better guy. I think it confirms what uh, the great late uh, uh, people's historian Howard Zinn uh, once wrote that it is less about who is sitting in the White House than who is sitting in, in the streets, in the cafeterias, in the halls of government, in the factories, who is protesting, who is occupying offices and demonstrating. Those are the things that determine what happens, as Howard wrote. So the political mood in the 60s and early 70s was so radical, in fact, so transformational, revolution was in the air, that these laws that Richard Nixon passed were seen as a compromise because the demand for challenging the fundamentals of the economic system, um, th th those were on the table, right? So this seemed, these were, these were moderate reforms in that context because the center had been moved. So let's review these ingredients that produced such interesting change. You had a period of upheaval, unapologetic utopian thought. It's punctuated, pierced by a painful shock, which is held up as exhibit A. Um, and you had the existence of a movement before the shock comes that was already questioning everything. And in this volatile, indeed revolutionary context, meaningful reforms are offered as a compromise. So, I offer this as a kind of a formula <laughs> um, that, that we can think about as we, as we try to hold on to some hope that it might not be too late, okay? But it, it shows how heavy a lift it is, but it also shows that it's possible. And I think if we look at American history, we see that in those moments of staccato change, of staccato pro progressive transformation, these factors have been there, most notably in the aftermath of the great market crash of 1929, right? Um, where so much of the progressive infrastructure of this country, uh, public imperfect, right? Public housing, social security, unemployment insurance, um, uh, electrification, uh, the legacy of the New Deal, regulation of the banks, so much was won in the aftermath of the greatest crisis that capitalism has ever experienced, the, the, the crash of 1929. But what was the context for that? Well, it was a context in which uh, revolution, once again, was in the air. You had a working class that was, that, was, that was talking about socialism, that was reading Marx, that was familiar with uh, the vision of W.E.B. Du Bois and of a united interracial working class movement um, that was questioning uh, the role of work in our lives. I mean, this is what I find most interesting looking back at the labor movement uh, of the 1920s and 30s. It, you know, today the labor movement is all about asking for jobs, right? Um, but in this era, much of the labor movement was about asking for leisure, asking for less work, right? The right to a good life, 
a, a good quality of life. Um, and it was really about that essential question of what is a good life? What is happiness? What does every human being have a right to? Um, so that was the context in which the, the, the crash came, is held up as evidence of the barbarism of the system, right? That we could gamble all of our futures uh, on this casino that could crash so spectacularly that you would have stockbrokers jumping out of windows and millions of people losing their homes and their farms and tent cities and Central Park and so on. Um, there was then a wave of revolutionary and disruptive organizing in the 1930s, a general strike in Minneapolis, an 83-day shutdown of the West Coast uh, by longshore workers, the Flint sit-down strikes, radical demands. The muckraking journalist Upton Sinclair ran for governor of California in this period, and you know, he was kind of the Bernie Sanders of his day, um, this unlikely populist candidate. And the centerpiece of his campaign was the New Deal isn't going far enough. We should give workers the means of production so that they can turn their factories into workers' cooperatives. And he got him almost a million votes in California. He was moving the center. And it was this context that allowed FDR to sell the New Deal as a compromise because the alternative looked that scary to the elites, right? So I think we have to understand these dynamics or what really produces political change. Because I think for so long, the environmental movement has been under this very misguided illusion that if we just scare people, educate people, create an understanding of the depth of this crisis, they will wake up and be like that frog in boiling water and jump, right? And that's an incredibly ahistorical um, version of how change happens, right? And I often get pushed back by my friends in the environmental movement when I write books with capitalism in the title, right? They're like, well, you're making it harder. Why are you making this about capitalism? It's just about carbon. And first of all, you know, I don't think we can separate carbon from capitalism. This is a, you know, a, 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 you know it, I don't think it's a coincidence that the commercial steam engine and the wealth of nations came out in the same year, not to mention the founding of this country. <laughs> um, it was a very action-packed year. Um, you know, this, this history is entirely intertwined, um, but more to the point, I don't think I'm making it harder <laughs> by talking about radical ideas, by putting radical ideas on the table. I think I'm making it easier because I think this is how change happens when radical ideas are in the air. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> The other thing that I, that I think is useful about, you know, in terms of the, particularly the 1930s as a model is though the kinds of change that were introduced in that era are not the kinds of change that you guys are working towards. I mean, these were big centralized state solutions for the most part, right? Um, and, you know, a lot of it was fossil fuel based in terms of the electrification and damming of rivers and so on. This, the, the velocity of it is of the order that we need right now, right? Um, and the only other analogy that we can reach towards that proves that it is possible for humans to act as quickly as we need to act in the face of this crisis is the way this economy was transformed during the Second World War. Also not the kinds of changes that we want. We don't want our factories to stop making cars and start making fighter jets. We want them to maybe stop making cars and start making public transit, um, you know, start making wind turbines. But it is possible to do th for this kind of change to happen if we understand the dynamics. Um, so shocks no longer have this kind of wake up call function, right? And this is what I documented in the shock doctrine is that it's actually the opposite. And what I found when I was researching the shock doctrine, and you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with that work, what, what the shock doctrine refer is, is a phrase that I came up with to describe this strategy that was developed by the right in the 1970s um, to use periods of crisis and the disorientation that follows a, a, a large scale shock in a society to push through very unpopular so-called reforms, 
okay? Uh, I quote Milton Friedman saying, only a crisis real or perceived produces real change. Our job is to keep the ideas ready until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. And this is, in the examples that I use, is incredibly anti-democratic. Uh, so, for instance, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina should have been a wake-up call for our side, right? It should have been a wake-up call because here you have this crisis born of a collision between heavy weather of the kind we're going to see more and more of because of climate change. When you warm oceans, you have more ferocious storms turned into a catastrophe because the storm slams into weak and neglected public infrastructure. The levees should have held, they did not hold because there had been warning after warning and the Army Corps had not repaired the levees, right? FEMA couldn't find New Orleans for five days. You had complete dysfunction. This is the legacy of neoliberalism, right? You neglect the public sphere for four decades, you cut it back, you cut it back, and lo and behold, it cannot deal with a crisis of this magnitude. And layered on top of all of that is systemic racism. And so the people who are abandoned on their rooftops in the Superdome are then animalized and vilified on television for going and getting the food and water that they need, right? Um, and vigilantes come into the city. And I was in New Orleans in this period, and black people were being hunted um, and being shot by police, by vigilantes, who were afraid that they were going to somehow escape the city and go to the suburbs. And it was just like so sci-fi. It was the vision of the future we've imagined so many times in every sci-fi film um, that, you know, I, you know, I often say that our greatest challenge is not to reimagine that future um, of a little bubbles of, 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 of fortress winners surrounded by hordes of locked out losers, which is essentially the plot of every sci-fi movie you're ever going to see, but imagine a different kind of future where we come together um, across divides in periods of crisis and believe that we can do that in our bones. So that, I think, is, is our task, is to tell a different kind of story. And the, I think the reason, you know, we've had these moments where, which should have been wake-up calls. Katrina, the 2008 financial crisis, right, which was <clears throat> so clearly the result of, uh, you know, getting rid of the laws that were passed in the aftermath of the, of the great crash of 1929, like Glass-Steagall's deregulating the financial markets, just letting these bubbles inflate, allowing these outrageous profits to be made, and then the bill for it gets passed on to regular people who were the most victimized by the crisis, who were losing their homes. They get victimized through more cutbacks to pay for the trillions of dollars in bailouts. So this should have been a wake-up call, and indeed it was a kind of a wake-up call. Around the world, you had um, a wave of, of, of organizing, protesting occupations. In this country, it was called Occupy Wall Street. Um, in Southern Europe, they ca called it the movement of the squares because, because uh, central squares in Greece and Spain and Portugal were being occupied for months on end. Um, it was the increase in food prices that set off the Arab Spring in the same period. So all around the world, people were saying no. We do not want this. And there was a slogan, we will not pay for your crisis that ricocheted around the world. But somehow it wasn't enough. And the reason it wasn't enough, and the reason I called my new book No Is Not Enough, is because what is clear from this is that just saying no, that is a bad idea, while it may hold, slow down or hold back the worst of the attacks, it is not going to get us where we need to go. We need a uh, we need a convincing, inspiring yes um, that is uh, a vision of the future that will keep us safe. <clears throat> you know, and, and, and the reason we haven't, we haven't had that is not because you know, we're bad people, it is because, I, I would argue, that we are products of our time and that we need to understand the flip side of the neoliberal project that has, was, you know, began in this country under Reagan and in the UK under Thatcher and then was globalized around the world as not just a project that was advancing a set of economic policies um, that Greg referred to as market fundamentalism, privatization, deregulation, low taxes offset with cuts to government spending. Flip side of that in this country was mass criminalization of communities of color uh, and mass incarceration. Um, it's not just that. It is also a war on the imagination. 
that was always central to the neoliberal project was saying there is no alternative, as Margaret Thatcher said, that there is nothing but this. Any idea you could possibly have about another way that we could live um, is inherently wrong and suspect, right? So we now have generations that have grown up without the muscle of imagining other possible futures and without those examples. And this is why the work that you're doing is so important in terms of dispelling the idea that there is only one way to live, only one way to build, only one way to interact with each other. Um, and there are many examples of this, growing examples of this, of, of, of uh, of, of proving to people through action, because you're not going to prove it to them just by saying it. You're going to prove it by feeling it, by living it, by seeing it, by touching it. Um, so the good news is that we're starting to see a revival of the utopian imagination. And I think we see this in a lot of social movements now that may be sparked by a crisis, like cops killing black people, um, you know, or unlivable wages. Um, but they are pairing their no's with transcendent yeses. And the movement for black lives is an incredible example of this. Um, they, last summer, in the middle of the election campaign, produced their own platform called the Vision for Black Lives, which if you haven't read it, you should look up Vision for Black Lives and read what is a blueprint for another world, another economy, which is not just about how do we get cops to stop shooting people, though it's about that too. Um, it's about demilitarizing schools, it's about prison abolition, it's about a just tax code, um, it is about reparations for slavery and Jim Crow uh, and other forms of systemic dis discrimination that translates into concrete policies like student loan forgiveness, free college education, and I would argue that we saw a resurgence of the utopian imagination in the way this country responded to Bernie Sanders. And I don't want to refight the last election and all of that, but I would just say that there has been such a focus on the outcome of that election and the, the horrific outcome of that election that we can lose sight of this seismic shift that happened on the progressive side, which is that we found out that progressive ideas, bold progressive ideas that we had been told for decades could never resonate with the American people are incredibly popular, especially with young people, right? So Bernie's out there, he's talking about free college tuition, forgiving student loans, universal public health care, 100% renewable energy by 2050, no new fossil fuel infrastructure, and the crowds are cheering. And he won 13 million votes, uh, and he took 20 states. That is a very, very big deal. Um, and it shows that if we do better next time and do better at building a broader progressive coalition that from day one uh, convinces communities of color that this coalition understands that it is impossible to separate white supremacy from the history of capitalism, uh, that this is not a project of just, well, we'll win on economics and everything else will be fixed in the trickle down, our own version of, of, of trickle down, um, that speaks to women and our understanding of the precariousness of the rights that have been won, um, that really weaves a coherent story of how all of these issues prop each other up. Because let me tell you, for Donald Trump, they understand that all of the attacks that they are waging are interconnected and part of a broader vision that they call making America great again, right? But so often on the progressive side of the, of the spectrum, we work in our silos um, and we're afraid of making those connections. And that is part of the legacy of neoliberalism. We are afraid to speak in the language of ideology, big ideas, and that is the work that's going to move the center so that we can win reforms. You know, we often have these, you know, the, the, these forces pitted against each other. Like, do you, um, the people who are talking uh, in sort of revolutionary terms are treated as enemies of concrete reforms, when in fact that is what creates space uh, for those reforms. So, so we have some interesting ingredients shifting. Neoliberalism has been in crisis since the 2008 financial crisis, and everybody saw that you can break the rules for people if, if, if they're rich enough, right? We'd been told there was no money for schools, no money for health care, no money for housing, but suddenly there are trillions of dollars to bail out the banks. You can't unlearn that once you see it, right? That was a very, very important moment. Um, you have this rising of a utopian imagination, and yes, we have a shock. His name is Donald Trump. He shocks us every day. Um, 
Now, I think it's complicated because I also think that the part of how we need to understand Donald Trump is that he's not, he's, he, he's the least lo shocking outcome. He's a cliche in a way. Um, I see him as living dystopian fiction in the sense that, you know, what dystopian fiction does is it takes current trends and it follows them to their logical conclusion, right? And then it holds up a mirror and says, do you, do you like what you see? Because this is where all roads lead here, right? And, and so many of the roads that we have been on lead directly to Donald Trump, so directly that if you were a fiction editor at Random House, you would say this, I'm sorry, I can't publish this book, it's too obvious, you know? Um, <laughs> so, there, I, I would say the advantage of this from a political organizing perspective is that Trump is making the need for systemic change seem much more obvious, much more appealing to large numbers of people. The shamelessness of his corporate coup. Um, if titans of American industry can eagerly line up behind this man with all of his viciousness, venom, venality, vanity, and vacuousness, and if Wall Street can cheer on news of his plans to let the planet burn and the elderly starve, and if so many of our media outlets can praise his cruise missiles ordered over chocolate cake as presidential, well then a great many people are coming to the conclusion that they want no part of a system like that. With this elevation of the basest of figures to the most exalted of positions, this culture of maximum greed, individualism, self-interest is reaching a kind of a breaking point. And there is a growing understanding out there that it is the culture itself that has to be confronted now and not policy by policy, but at the root. So things are shifting. They're shifting very, very quickly. We have some of the ingredients, the radical thought, the shock. Do we have the credible revolutionary threat yet? Well, we have more people <laughs> uh, getting involved in politics than you know, any organizer who I know has ever seen in their lifetime, right? You have, every march is exceeding all expectations for turnout, um, starting with the women's march uh, on Trump's first day on the job, right? Um, it's pretty amazing. <clears throat> the march for science, um, you know, tens of thousands of scientists standing up, yes. Sanctuary cities. Sanctuary, sanctuary spaces of all kinds. People saying, no, we are going to stand up to the forces that would deport our neighbors, right? And people taking it upon themselves because they understand precisely that there are no protectors in officialdom, that it is up to us and people acting like that. There is something healthy about that. Um, there are the incredible movements standing up to new fossil fuel infrastructure and, um, you know, uh, very powerfully at Standing Rock, although ultimately at this point unsuccessfully, but that fight is not over. And in part thanks to cities like Seattle, which are going after the banks that are investing in <laughs> projects like that. Pulling $80 million have been pilled. $80 million and counting have been pilled from the banks uh, that are financing the Dakota Access Pipeline. So this fight is far from over. And Seattle has been a leader, as Seattle has been a leader, um, in, in, in taking on fossil fuel infrastructure and new fossil fuel frontiers, right? Just because they're doing this in Washington does not mean that on the ground it is gonna happen. And that is what Shell realized when they made the mistake of parking their Arctic drilling rig in this city uh, for a little bit of maintenance when they were surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of kayaktivists led by indigenous communities, communities of color. They said no, and a few months later, Shell announced that it was pulling out of the Arctic for the foreseeable future. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> an example of, um, of getting to yes. And there are lots of, uh, and I want to stress that there are lots of spaces in which this conversation is happening, where movements like uh, the Movement for Black Lives, the Fight for 15, the Dreamers, um, the Climate Justice Movement, the Labor Movement are coming together across differences to try to figure out what a common forward-looking agenda 
could look like. Um, and it's hard, right? It's very hard because people are having to do so much at the same time. There are so many uh, defensive battles that people have no choice but to engage in, right? Because they're fight we are fighting for our lives on so many different fronts, right? So there has to be a no. This is not about saying, well, we're only going to be about yes, no. <laughs> um, we have a duty to say no when our neighbors are being deported, when communities are being criminalized. Um, when pipelines are being pushed through indigenous communities without their consent. We have to say no, but at the same time, we understand that even if we were to win every one of these defensive battles, which we won't win all of them, then best case scenario, we're standing exactly where we were before Donald Trump was elected. And that is the ground that gave us Donald Trump. That ground is not safe. That's why these movements were rising before Donald Trump came along. So we need to do this complicated thing. Um, we need to say no and yes, maybe it's a sort of a Tai Chi move. <laughs> we, need to say, we need to say no and yes simultaneously. We need to weave together our no and yes as twin strands of DNA. Um, so I want to talk about an experience that we ha had in Canada about a year and a half ago where we tried to do this. We found ourselves in the middle of an election campaign. Um, and. Uh, we had a very right-wing government, Stephen Harper's government, and there was a huge amount of anger at this government um, that had been telling people that they had to choose between a healthy environment and, uh, and, and a healthy economy. And Canada had become a complete climate renegade, but our economy was doing relatively well. So it was sort of this deal with the devil where everyone was sort of trying not to look at this giant hole at the center of our country that is the Alberta tar sands, okay? Um, and then what happened is that the price of oil collapsed. It went from $100 a barrel to $50 a barrel in a period of six months, which is a shock. It is a very shocking event, especially for an economy that has bet the farm on fossil fuels. Not just fossil fuels, but a very expensive kind of fossil fuels because the tar sands aren't just very, very dirty. When you have to mine oil because it's in a semi-solid form, it costs a lot of money to do so. So it is no longer economically feasible when the price of oil goes to $50 or even $30 at its low. So um, more than 100,000 workers have been laid off in the Alberta tar sands. Um, it has been absolutely devastating. And we found ourselves in this situation where we were told we had to choose between a healthy environment and a healthy economy, and we ended up with neither, right? Um, so, we decided to try to, to intervene in the election because what we saw was that none of the major political parties that had a chance of unseating the conservatives had a platform that was in line with the climate science, that was connecting the dots between indigenous rights and the need for climate action um, and the need to fight inequality. These were being treated as separate issues. And so we had this gathering of 60 movement leaders and organizers, um, very interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral. Um, we had the union representing workers in the Alberta tar sands, and we had Greenpeace, and we had um, some incredibly respected indigenous elders, and we had housing rights activists and food justice activists and migrant rights activists, and we sat together for two days. Um, and it was really hard because we realized that we had no experience doing what we were trying to do that we had come together in coalition before, but they had always been coalitions of the no. We had come together to say, we don't like this trade deal, or we don't like this government, or we don't like this very aggressive set of austerity policies, but we had not come together to say what we actually agree together we do want, to try to paint a picture of the future that we want. So we did that, and it was hard. <laughs> um, there's a lot of difficult history between a lot of those movements in the room. Um, we had a few ground rules. One was that no one is allowed to play my crisis is bigger than your crisis, okay? <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, if you are fighting for uh, people to have roofs over their head, that is the crisis, you know? And there is, this, there is this unfortunate history in parts of the environmental movement of sort of going like, well, first we'll save the planet and then we'll worry about all these other things because if we don't save the planet, not, you know, it doesn't, we're never gonna solve racism or we're never gonna, and it's just like, whoa, that's how you piss a lot of people off, right? Um, like, I wonder why this movement is so white, right? Um, so we decided, no, <laughs> we live, <laughs> 
We live in a time of integrated, overlapping crises. They are all urgent, and what we need are integrated solutions. We need solutions that radically bring down emissions, fight inequality, and begin to heal the wounds that date back to the founding of our countries. Um, so we start, we, we, um, uh, my role in this um, was really just to listen and, uh, and we did, had all kinds of breakout exercises and all this, and you know, anybody who's interested in the process and wants to start a LEAP group in your community, um, go to leap, uh, uh, leapmanifesto.org. We've got all kinds of resources there. Um, but what, so what we did was, uh, we, you know, we had all of these spaces where we tried to draw out connections, and there were these very clear connections around living in an extractive economy. And you, usually that phrase just refers to resources, right? And, and I think in a lot of the circles that you guys work in, that's you know, it, it, as you shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, a lot of the time we're talking just about our relationship with the earth, right? But what was really striking listening to people who were working on homelessness and migrant rights and mass incarceration and labor rights was that everybody was facing this culture of maximum extraction as if there are no consequences. And it wasn't just about extracting from the earth, it was extracting from workers' bodies, it was extracting from communities um, and cutting back and cutting back as if there's no consequences, if there's no limit to taking, no limit to pushing, no consequences for those actions, right? Um, and that what we really, and when we talked about the future that we wanted, this phrase of care kept coming up, that we wanted a culture of care and inclusion and cherishing where everybody was valued rather than this culture of extraction and disposal, right? Um, you think about the extraction from the earth and those, the huge slag heaps of what the mining industry calls overburden, right? Um, well, people are also treated as overburden and we need to, and, 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 and treated like garbage to, to be contained in jail and we wanted to switch from that culture to a culture of, of caretaking for the earth and for each other. So we came up with this document at, um, called the Leap Manifesto, sorry. Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, and we chose the word leap because, you know, um, in, in Canada, people uh, like to pride themselves on their sort of cautious centrism. You know, we don't get too excited. We're not like you Americans. Um, and we kind of wanted to raise a defiant a middle finger to that sort of cautious centrism that is so exquisitely dangerous in the context of the climate crisis. We do need to be bold and we do need change on multiple fronts. Um, we called it the leap also because when we, when we wrote it and launched it, it was a leap year. And we liked uh, the metaphor of a leap year because if you think about what a leap year is, um, it is a rare admission um, that the human created systems of measurement that we have do not sync up with the laws of nature, right? That our human created calendars do not sync up with the Earth's revolution around the sun. And if we don't change our rules by tacking on a weird extra day every four years and confusing everybody, um, well, then we're, we're in a world of pain. So, um, and, and, and it reinforces the fact that it is easier to change our human created systems than to change the laws of nature, um, despite what almost all economists seem to believe. Um, so we called, um, the centerpiece of it, as you see here, is energy democracy. It was very much inspired by the German energy transition, um, where as they have very rapidly shifted to renewable energy, on, you know, on some days they're getting 50% of their power from renewables, uh, and a lot of it is decentralized and community controlled um, and run. They, in hundreds of cities, uh, they have taken back control over their energy grids from the private companies that were running them for profit. And they're now, when, when there are excess profits from producing renewable energy, it stays in the community and they're able to use it to pay for community services, daycares and community centers. Um, so it's fighting austerity is fighting climate change, and it's creating huge numbers of jobs. They've created 400,000 jobs in this energy transition. So we said that we want energy democracy, but we also said that we want energy justice and energy reparations, so that the communities that have been on the front lines of our toxic addiction to fossil fuels must be first in line to own and control their own renewable energy projects. And that is a basic principle. Front lines first. <clears throat> 
so there's, a, you know, it's a really uh, wide-ranging document. Um, it also acknowledges the role that our own governments, and certainly your government's uh, policies have played in driving migration, um, in pushing uh, trade deals that are pushing people off of their lands, resource extraction that are pushing people off of their lands, accelerating climate change that is overlaying on top of conflicts and acting as an accelerant to war and driving migration. Um, and so it calls for opening our borders to many more migrants and refugees and for all workers, regardless of status, to be protected by full and equal rights. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is redefine what a climate job is because, I mean, as you would expect from a document like this that is drawn in collaboration with trade unions, um, it, it calls for these huge investments in transit, efficiency, renewables. Um, we know that we can create six to eight times more jobs in these sectors than if we invest the same money in fossil fuels. Um, and another core principle of the Elite Manifesto is that no worker is left behind, so that the workers in the high carbon economy uh, are democratic participants in this transition, in their retraining, um, and you know, we've worked with, uh, there's a group in the tar sands called Iron in Earth, which is workers in the tar sands who are demanding that they be retrained to become solar workers um, and you know, putting solar panels on schools for starters, right? I, this sh should be a no-brainer. It's amazing that it isn't happening very, very quickly. Um, so that's what, that was one of the core principles, but we also wanted to say, well, wait a minute, you know, a green job, a low-carbon job isn't just a guy in a hard hat putting up a solar panel. It is that, but um, you know, daycare workers are low carbon workers. Uh, taking care of the elderly is low carbon work. Teaching is low carbon work. Um, and these are sectors that um, are overwhelmingly dominated by women, overwhelmingly dominated by women of color. This is some of the most undervalued work in our economy under relentless attack by the logic of austerity. So we said, these are climate jobs, and as we contract um, uh, in the extractive sectors, we need massive expansion in the caring economy because this is the work that improves tangibly the quality of life in our communities. Um, it's expensive to do this kind of thing, um, which is why we worked with a fantastic team of progressive economists who came up with a companion document called We Can Afford to Leap. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's a good thing that we live in a time of unprecedented private wealth. Um, we identified the logic of economic austerity um, as, as being at war with life on Earth. The money that we need for this transition is out there. We just have to have the courage to go after it. Um, and these are a few of the ways. I think that last one cuts to military spending. Um, there's quite a bit of work to, to be done in this country. So the LEAP, you know, the LEAP has 15 demands in all, uh, you know, everything from what a real progressive renegotiation of trade deals would look like um, to calling for a debate about a guaranteed annual income um, to getting money out of politics, uh, electoral reform so every vote counts. Um, and you can see why since we launched the LEAP, there's been a lot of interest in this country um, for using it as a kind of a template for movements to come together in a common agenda, right? One thing um, we were very conscious of is that we didn't want it to just be a laundry list. We wanted it to be a different story about this shift from, uh, from disposal to inclusion, from endless taking to caretaking, uh, so that we're really connecting the dots with a new story about how all of our issues fit together, because there's not really any shortage of places you can go for a laundry list, um, but what we need are new stories. <clears throat> We've been amazed by the reaction to it. Tens of thousands of people in the country signed it during the election. Um, and it was, uh, and, and you know, I, a Canadian celebrity may sound like a bit of an oxymoron, but we have some. And, they, uh, you know, people like uh, Neil Young and Arcade Fire and Ellen Page and all signed it. And Leonard Cohen, who was still alive, added his name. We were so happy. And it reminded me of this um, slogan that I first heard when I was in Argentina during a very fractious uh, election campaign, which was our dreams don't fit on your ballots. <laughs> um, and so people were voting, 
but they were saying, don't mistake our vote for a reflection of what we actually want. We're voting strategically, we're saying no to this government we need to get rid of, but this document represents the world we actually want, right? Um, and so people were asking us for lawn signs and things like that. And I think it's, you know, I think in this moment in the US, it's really important to think about these models of people's platforms, of people coming together, not waiting for messianic political leaders to come along and do this for us, right? What we need are people who are the experts in the red lines in their communities coming together, telling these stories, starting small at the city level, at the neighborhood level, spreading out to the state level, and there are discussions going on already at all of, the, all of those levels in this country, um, and being very clear on what the vision is so that when the next wave of uh, politicians come forward to say, we're the ones that are gonna take you to the promised land, uh, the message is slow down, here's our list, <laughs> here's our vision, and, we're, and, and our vision is going to lead and you guys can follow. So um, just to wrap up here, <laughs> no, and I think this is really important psychologically as well, because as I said, you know, we are seeing these unprecedented levels of engagement, um, but we're already starting to hear from people that they feel burnt out, that they feel tired. What is the plan? You know, um, the no, you know, no to Trump, no to racism, no to corporate malfeasance, that may be what initially brings people into the streets, you know, into their first political meeting of their lives. But it is the yes that will keep us together, engaged, dreaming, planning. The yes is the beacon in the coming storms, the light that will prevent us from losing our way. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to do it, take a couple? Yeah, sure. So we, we have time for a couple of questions because I managed not to speak for a whole hour. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so there are some mic runners in the audience. Along the lines of what you've just been saying about building community, could it be that we could do something where the marches become something more surgical, that are more effective, because the media doesn't really uh, cover the marches that much. Yeah. And I'm saying, uh, why don't we have the same kind of group sitting together, like you just said, with Greenpeace, Food and Water Watch, Sierra Club, Natural Conservatory, you know, they're on and on and on. There's all these groups, and have them go to the council meetings with signs and kind of do a more political thing like what you're saying in a fo more focused, surgical way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think some of that, a lot of that is happening. Um, and, you know, I think there will be moments where marches are still going to be important. Um, but I do think we need to be a little careful about, about resources. You know, it's it's expensive to, to move millions of, you know, to try to move hundreds of thousands of people to a big march. Um, there are limited resources. It's, it's expensive in terms of energy, like all of the organizations just spend all their, you know, for weeks ahead of time, spend a huge amount of their energy just trying to do that. Um, so I think what you're saying is really important. One thing I would say is that there are, like, there are moments when it is incredibly important to take to the streets, and I think we saw that with the Muslim travel ban, um, where it's just like where something is happening, and the most important thing that everybody can do is just get out of their house, right, and flood the streets. And, and those, I think what we will see more of is that the most powerful of those demonstrations will be more spontaneous, right, that will, that will, will not be something that was months in the planning, right? And one thing I can say as somebody who has studied moments of shock and crisis quite a lot for, you know, the past couple decades, and I don't mean to, you know, I said that we were skipping the apocalyptic portion of the uh, evening, but I, I do have to say, um, because I can't let 
this past, you know, to being in a room of, you know, however, a thousand people, is that as bad as what we are seeing now from Trump et al., um, this is them without a crisis to exploit, okay? Um, and everything they're doing at the policy level is pretty much a guarantee of creating crises, right? And they're creating all kinds of enemies. They're confirming the narrative that the U.S. is at war with Islam. Um, I don't think Trump's little trip to Saudi Arabia is going to fix that. Um, <laughs> and even, you know, on the market level, right? I mean, they're getting rid of the, of the inadequate reforms that were introduced after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and the, the regulations that they're getting rid of, the environmental regulations they're getting rid of are, are pretty much a guarantee that we're going to see more industrial disasters, right? And each one of these, if history tells us anything, will be uh, an excuse to push forward even more radical parts of their platform. They have more radical parts of their platform that they're not able to advance without a crisis. We saw this during the Muslim travel ban, right? So what they need are moments of extraordinary politics where rules are suspended. And nothing does that like a terrorist attack. And you know, I'm not saying that it is necessarily going to happen and I'm not spinning a conspiracy theory that they're gonna plan it. I'm saying that their policies are provoking these types of events. And if that happens, I believe that we will see attempts to ban protest. I believe we will see um, very frightening attacks on the press. Um, the, uh, you know, we've already heard um, Trump talk about bringing in the feds to cities like Chicago. Um, we've seen people appointed to his administration um, that are actively at war with Black Lives Matter and the Department of Homeland Security. So when that happens, when if that happens and people are told stay home, that is so important that people go out. Like, that is the moment when everybody gets out of their house. Hello? <laughs> I'm over here. To your right. Hi. I see you. Hi, thanks. Um, I was like, oh, I'm on the, in the corner. Uh, Naomi, thanks so much for uh, being with us. This is great to have you here. Uh, I think, as you know, this is very much a community of creating the yes. You know, this is kind of, we like to say we're creating a parallel universe that uh, when everybody's ready, they can just jump on board and we actually do it. Um, and I think there's also an amazing communities of no out there, um, all the climate activists that are fighting the pipeline right now. and. Um, I think there's often a sense that the community of yes and community of no are both so busy doing what they're doing that they have a hard time connecting. And I'd really love to hear your thoughts on how we can bring the community of no and the community of yes together and create uh, this parallel universe together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And I think we are starting to see that. I mean, one of the things that was really moving about being at Standing Rock um, in December was was the way the yes was so deeply woven into the camps themselves and how people were living and um and so many of the of the local leaders were talking about well as soon as soon as they're able to stop the pipeline the next project is to turn this community into a living example of the next economy right the post fossil fuel economy and now even though the oil is flowing people are still focused on that. So I think, you know, part of it is about putting your, your skills and your services, your, you know, your genius at the service of communities of resistance, right? So that they can weave in the yes um, into their no, so that the no becomes a living example. And we've ha we have seen, you know, small examples of this, you know, kind of in miniature, like you know, a, 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 a renewable energy farm being put in the path of the Keystone XL pipeline, right? So in the way they're saying no, they are saying, they are showing the yes, right? So I think we have to think really creatively um, more ways we can do this, um, you know, and, and also ways to really amplify it um, because a lot of it's happening and people don't know. Yeah, thanks. Over here on the, the left of you, Naomi, way in the far corner. 
Um, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Hi there. Um, last night, Dennis Hayes asked us uh, basically to step up for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which is in 2020, and said we've got three years to plan for it. And uh, so that's enough time to do some really great things, including design and build some living buildings. But I'm wondering, do you have any good ideas for us uh, for Earth Day, 50th anniversary, to make a statement and help create this vision we're all looking to achieve? Huh. Um, I might need to think about that a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think it's so, whatever it looks like, it needs to explode the idea of what the environmental movement is, right? It needs, um, you know, it needs, I think that one of the biggest problems we face is this idea that this is a, a sort of a, a movement for people who aren't facing daily emergencies, so they have excess time and energy and money, right, um, to, to engage in this kind of, of, of work. And it has sent this message that this is a movement that you know, isn't for people who are worried about putting food on the table and, um, and, and, and desperately need jobs and so on. So I was really excited by the People's Climate March and that, that just happened in Washington and you had one locally here um, because it centered justice and jobs uh, and yeah, it took leadership from frontline communities. Um, and, 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 and represented a deeper engagement with labor. So I would just say that our, you know, it's such a pressing task that we explode this myth um, that we have to choose between jobs, well-being, meaningful work, um, and a safe planet. That is the most pressing task because it was a huge part of what got D Donald Trump elected, um, was playing on the, the failure of our movement to, to really deeply address this. So whatever it is, it's got to look different. <clears throat> Hello, Naomi. I'm back here. Um, I have a question about the financial system mm -hmm. and specifically the role you see for community and or state banks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a really big role. Um, and, and moving our money. Um, we have a tremendous opportunity because there's so much, uh, there's so much interest in, uh, in, in divesting from the institutions that are uh, at the center of this economy of death, whether it's the fossil fuel companies or the banks that fund them. And we saw with DAPL and we've seen with the fossil fuel divestment movement that people um, really want to move their money. But I don't think there is enough coherence around where we're moving our money to. Um, and also, what, 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 and as we're moving, you know, tens of millions of dollars, or in the case of divestment, we're talking about trillions of dollars now that have committed to not investing in fossil fuels. Um, I think we need to be more ambitious about what we're asking of the institutions where we are investing or where we are putting our money, because this is some pretty serious leverage, right? Um, and I think it, you know, it, it, some of these banks that where people are moving their money to or credit unions or state banks do invest in fossil fuels. So um, it, I think we need to get, be better organized in terms, of, uh, in terms of making those demands. I'll give you a, a, just one tiny example. One of the things that, that came out of the LEAP Manifesto that we were most excited about was a project that we did with the postal workers. Um, the postal union in Canada, like post, you know, post offices all uh, around the world are facing this crisis because people don't use the mail the way they used to. They use Amazon, they use email, and post offices are in crisis. So there was this big threat to cancel home delivery um, uh, in Canada to shut down hundreds of post offices, maybe sell the whole thing to FedEx. Um, so we have this really visionary postal workers union who came to us and. Um, worked with us to design a new vision for the post office called Delivering Community Power, which says, well, look, we have this incredible public infrastructure. We have, we have bricks and mortar institutions in every single town in the country. There are more of them than there are uh, Tim, outlets of Tim Hortons, which if you know anything about Canada, you know that's a lot. That's a lot. And so why would we give that up? Why don't we reimagine it? 
Um, and a centerpiece of it was postal, what was postal banking, the idea that your post office could be your bank and a way to you know, get away from payday lenders, uh, to have real accountability, but more than that, that the post office could be a hub for the green transition, right? So that this would be um, where you plug in your electric vehicle, so it would solve the problem of where do I plug in at your post office, outside every post office, that you could get a loan from the, your postal bank to start your own renewable energy project and get advice, um, and also that the fleet of uh, postal vehicles would be made in Canada, would be electric, but also that they would be delivering more than mail, that they would be part of this caring economy so that they would be delivering um, local, locally grown produce, um, that they would be checking in on the elderly. Um, and it was just, it was an amazing uh, example of going beyond no, like, you know, the traditional role for unions in, the con in, in a context like this is just to say, no, we want things the, the way they were last year, you know? Um, and instead they, you know, rose to the occasion and said, no, we want transformation. We understand it's not working, but the response should not be just to sell off this tremendous asset, it's to reinvent it. Uh, and banking, re real, you know, public community controlled banking was a huge part of that. Um, I think we're, we're, we're out of time, but I would just say, you know, what, uh, just a final message um, for you guys is, uh, you know that moment during, during, the, um, D, during the DNC when Michelle Obama said, um, when they go low, we go high, right? <clears throat> um, it was a great moment. She was talking about tone, right? But I think we should take that, that mantra, that ethos, and apply it to deed, right? That, uh, you know, we have to understand that in Washington, they control some very powerful parts of government, but they don't control everything. They don't control what we do in our cities. They don't control what we do in our towns. They don't control what, they, what we do in our faith institutions. It, they don't control what we do as individuals and in groups. They don't control what we do in universities. And so as they go lower and lower, all of us need to go higher and higher. We need to demand more of ourselves, of each other. Um, we need to prove that more is possible in all of the domains that Trump does not control. Thank you so much, guys. <clears throat>